my contribution to the financial world is from my Austrian background, I saw that your need for finance during your lifetime is much greater than your need for protection. And the life insurance companies have been advocating uh, solving the death claim. Oh, by the way, uh, if you have an emergency of some kind, you could buy a policy loan to tide you over. Well, your need for finance is much greater. Solve for that totally. And if you do, you go ahead and put up so much death claim here, you can't get it past the underwriters. You'll have to end up insuring everybody you have an insurable interest in. For instance, uh, years ago in the uh, late 80s, two associates and I uh, sold UAB, Department of Medicine, of uh, this concept. Now, that's a world class medical school we have there. Uh, to give you an idea of the quality of what goes on in the medical community in uh, Birmingham. Uh, again, do y'all know anything about pro football? Yeah. Well, how about Don Brady? Y'all know him? Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, he about, what, five years ago, first game of the year, he got hurt. They tried to get it fixed in New, Ang New England. Nobody could fix it. Well, guess where they sent him? Birmingham, Alabama. Wow. Andrew. Andrews fixed it. Uh, he spent, uh, Brady spent six months in re uh, recovery uh, in Birmingham. Uh, yeah. He owes his career to Andrew. Well, how about New Orleans? <coughs> Saints. New Orleans Saints? Tom uh, Shove. Uh, Drew Brees. Sammy Sammy. Six months. Recovery. Six months? Wow. Yes, sir. Uh, Andrew did. <coughs> so that gives you an idea of what we got there. All right, we sold uh, EOD, Department of Medicine. We had a good contact there uh, that you guys are going at it backward out there in the financial world. You, you're leasing uh, high-speed copiers and medical equipment, all that kind of stuff, uh, when all you really had to do was buy high-priced life insurance on all the department heads. Now, after a couple of years, you got a lot of cash values. They'll go buy the copiers and so forth and lease them to these other guys, <laughs> lease these other medical these other departments that had caught on. You got to capture your customer there. They like that idea. Well, uh, would you believe that, so they bought high price life insurance on, on the, the, yeah, all right. Would you believe that uh, less than three years went by, they had their first death claim? They didn't buy this for death benefit. They bought this for solving uh, the banking function. But one of those doctors, Bob, Bob, died of a severe case of lead poison. You know what that is? Yeah. That's a bullet to the mouth. Yeah. You take that stuff orally, <laughs> short range, and have a lot, it will kill you. 38 to 45 caliber size. Yes, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, one dose is enough. <laughs> <laughs> if, you place, if you place it correctly. <laughs> All right. Now, just a few years after that, uh, Dr. Whitaker was a big name down there, and he was in a bike race up in Nashville, and his bike got tangled up, tangled up with another bike. Landed exactly wrong. Broken neck. <clears throat> All right, in comes that great big gob of money. Now, you know that uh, the, those two death claims exceeded their premiums, uh, total premiums, for about nine years. And, this does happen. They didn't buy it for death benefit. Do y'all understand that when I conjured all this up, I had to load up on me. I skipped my three children. I bought insurance on Mary. Uh, I, we bought insurance on grandchildren and now great-grandchildren. Uh, I insured four uh, business partners that were in the real estate business uh, and one in the life insurance business. Uh, would you believe I've already had two death claims? I didn't buy it for death benefit. I bought it as a place that I could put money, Dean, that I could borrow to pay off those snakes and dragons. They were charging me 23% interest back then in the early 80s and such. That's why I bought it. But uh, this uh, real estate guy, he and I bought a piece of property together uh, and <coughs> partnership. I bought insurance on him. Uh, now, Four years later, we'd sold the property into the partnership, right? But once an insurable interest is established, that's yours for life. They can't take it away from you. I had nothing to do with him the next 10 years, Bob. 
During that 14 years, I had paid into the policy uh, 47,000 premium, but I had borrowed out 48,000 to pay off the banks and such. And when he died, Stephen, what happened to that $48,000 debt? Gone. Gone. And didn't that $207,000 debt benefit going to be tax free? Mm -hmm. And didn't that cancel out a lot of mistakes I'd made in life before? Yeah. That's the power of this stuff. Now, my insurance partner, uh, I had two small policies on him, and I didn't again buy them for debt benefit. But uh, uh, he died anyway, whatever. Uh, by the way, that uh, real estate guy, he died of a heart attack sitting in the doctor's waiting room, waiting to see it. He's 50 years old. <laughs> It does happen. All right, so these are positives here. This is the negative. Uh, now, at the end of the year, the directors of the uh, uh, mutual insurance company calls in uh, the accountants and say, how do we do on Will's policy this year? Now, um, time has passed, Will, uh, to say two or three years or something like that. Uh, yeah, how do we do on Will's policy? Well, you got to take into consideration those actuaries, right? They tell the, the direct, the uh, rate makers, oh, we can compute all this pretty good because uh, this is probably the only real strong variable of uh, earnings. We got to guess and on a conservative basis. We're not looking for high rates of return. We're looking for stability over a long period of time. That's rule number one. Think long range. Think elite. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right, now, uh, they can be pretty accurate here. Death line, projecting accurate. They can be pretty accurate here in anticipating expenses because they've been at it for quite a while. But these are positive, these are negatives. Uh, well, uh, the net result would be an ever-increasing uh, pool of cash. Well, uh, because of those variables, there's a possibility of being below that projection, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Somebody got to hold this thing up. That's normally the function of a stockholder. So the uh, actuaries tell the rate makers, y'all got to take that in consideration. We don't have any stockholders. So consider that line that's projected that's going to be constantly increasing. Uh, if we could uh, produce that for a premium of one, whatever one is, uh, don't y'all collect one. Collect 1.1. 1 .1. That 1.1, 1 .1, that point one is the capital that makes all this thing go. And so, uh, uh, how do we do on uh, Will's uh, policy? It says, well, time has gone by and uh, we collected 1.1. But uh, they only took 0.8 to do the job this year. Well, that means the directors can make a decision with 0.3. Now, if the directors are halfway smart, and, and everyone I've ever seen is, they will put some of that in a contingency fund. It does not show up in cash values, Curtis. Contingency fund. They distribute 0.275 and call that a dividend. Now. The, the general public out there sees the word dividend, and every time they say, here comes the IRS or whatever you have in Canada, yeah. here comes the tax man. Wrong. That is a return of capital. A return of capital is not a taxable event. Ask any CBA. The Supreme Court ruled that years ago in the USA that, uh, that the return of capital was a mutual company. Now, if you take that dividend and chunk it back in the policy by paid up additional insurance at no cost, actually what you have is a, a constantly increasing uh, pool of money. It can't go backwards. It's impossible. All right. Now, those dividends bec can become humongous. Now, uh, maybe I've told y'all I have... Uh, I had, Okay, I was in a family of four boys. I'm number three. Number two, my next older brother, uh, he uh, died at age uh, 52 with a heart attack uh, playing handball with one of his 
my son's first day of January, 1981. Now, brother, uh, he was a big time uh, jock. Uh, three years older than me, so he was involved in World War II. Uh, he, uh, in the freshman year, played quarterback for Auburn University on scholarship. And then went in the Navy for a couple of years and whatnot. Anyway, when he got back out of the uh, service and uh, finished college, uh, he got in the life insurance business with Franklin Life. Y'all ever heard of them? Yeah. All right. Uh, anyway, he fell on his face. He, he, he just, it didn't work for him. So he went back to football coaching and such. And, uh, he had a state championship in Georgia uh, one year. Okay, then uh, his brother-in-law convinces him, uh, his brother-in-law was a state farm agent in uh, Griffin, Georgia, convinces him to get in the uh, insurance business with state farm. And so back there in 1959, I'm 28 years old, and these are my forestry days in eastern North Carolina. Brother sells me this policy uh, when I'm 28 years old for 388 uh, a year. And don't y'all laugh at that. Can you afford it? Everything is relative. Uh, any of y'all got military background in here at all? All right. Then you know what uh, a second lieutenant's pay was, base pay was in 1953? Uh, $213.75. You got that every month, whether you needed it or not. <laughs> then you needed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, two thirteen seventy five per month. Now you got $75 of uh, housing allowance. And you got uh, $42 of food allowance. But do y'all know we got along very well on that? It's all relative to what? Yeah. Huh? I'll bet my brother bragged to his peers for at least two months about what he sold me. That can give you an idea of what they were like back in those days. Now, I was making $10,000 a year back in those days. Now, a uh, 28 year old making, uh, making uh, 10,000 a year at that time was above the average bear. Now, uh, these are the last 25 years of the actual performance of this policy. This is history, folks. This is not fantasy. This is not projections. You can't argue with history. Now here's the legend here, the red is the premium, the, uh, this light colored, whatever it is, guaranteed cash value increase per year. Uh, the blue is the annual dividend. And this is the total of the two. All right, so back there in 1980, uh, yeah, 90 rather, I paid uh, 388, but the guaranteed cash value increase was $500. The dividend that year was $2,000. Some of them twenty five hundred. Well, I paid three eighty eight. Mm. Now, can they take that dividend away from me? No. no. All right. Now, out there, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but there's lots of stock companies out there. The whole they say all oh, those guarantee those dividends y'all talk about they're not guaranteed. Now, once they're paid, uh, Richard, they're guaranteed. It can't go backwards. They cannot represent the dividends. So all that conversation they come up with is moot. The only dividend that's not guaranteed is the next year. And then, but once it's paid, that's it. All right, now do y'all notice that the dividend went up the next year? Well, uh, you may not be aware that in 1991 there was a reversal of the economy. But the dividend went up. All right, Mark, you notice he went up the next well, year? I've been around a long time, so I watched that, yeah. Sir? What did you say? I said I've been around since 77. In the yes, sir. Been, that, that, that got a t-shirt, right? Okay. <laughs> Wear it proudly. Yes, sir. <laughs> anyway, well, these reversals in the economy, but yet this, the dividend uh, kept going up with State Farm. How did they do that? Well, remember the contingency fund, Stephen? My answer is, they said, that's why we have a contingency fund. There's been a reversal in the economy, but we've got money we can just dip in there and pay the dividend that we projected. Well, when they got to this point uh, here, they said, uh, oh, wait a minute. That dividend scale, dividend contingency fund has got a little skinny on us. 
So let's just pay last year's dividend. Well, uh, here they, in my opinion, said uh, we need to fatten up that dividend uh, roof of show, that contingency fund pool again. Let's reduce the dividend and put more in the contingency fund. Now, you notice that uh, when you connect these and you connect those, they're parallel lines. Got that? Now, you notice there's an aberration about every four or five years or something like that. That's just... Like, all right, let's fast forward, Bob. Let's get out here to 2005. At this point, I'm 74 uh, and a half years old. All right. Uh, I paid 388 premium. Guaranteed cash value increase that year, $800. Dividend, $4,200. $5,000 total increase. I paid 388 That premium, actually, I uh, wrote State Farm a, a note. Change the dividend election. Send it to me from now on. Now, Stephen, I don't need the money, but I want to be able to show people checks. Because you see, I'm out there uh, teaching this to people that are not in the insurance business. Trying to get them to understand how this stuff works and uh, what can be done. Well, uh, I want to show them checks because you see those people. You, a life insurance person says uh, dividend so and so, uh, and used a number. I guarantee you, it'll go in one ear, right out the other. Those guys gotta be lying. They all, all those guys in the life insurance business, they lie. <laughs> well, if you can't believe a check, uh, Curtis, I can't help you. Okay. All right. So here's the first check. Uh, 3877. That's just 10 times the premium, that's all. <laughs> now, that was dated uh, in uh, 2004. Oh, I'm sorry, 2006. Sorry, 2006. Now, the next year, the dividend is uh, in 2007, 3927. Well, 3927 is better than 3877, isn't it? It's like. Uh -huh. All right, here's the next check, 2008. Now, y'all tell me what happened in the financial world in 2008, please. They almost brought the whole financial world crumbling. You got that right. But what happened to my State Farm dividend? You went up, 39.73. All right, now here's the next check. Uh, this is 2009, 4,015. It still was going up. Now, y'all don't see any more checks, do you? You see, Mark, I got a letter from State Farm the next year. Uh, see that eight, uh, August 24, 2009 was when I got that check. Okay, those checks kept coming in August, in August, about that same day. Well, in early July of the following year, I get a letter from State Farm. Send me your social security number again. Uh, clerical errors do occur. We want to make sure we got it right because that uh, four thousand and fifty-seven dollar check that you'll be getting is going to be a taxable event, and you're going to get a ten ninety-nine at the end of the year to put on your income tax. Yeah, y'all got that? So they changed the tax code? Oh no! Oh no! Pay so attention! Pay attention! I have recovered everything I put in the policy. At that point, I had nothing in that policy, uh, Curtis. Nothing. Okay. Now, notice the verbiage here. When I replied to them, no, you are not going to send me a 1099 at the end of the year. You are going to change the dividend election to buy a paid up edition silent, regardless of my insurability, I'm an insurable. How about them apples? Right. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Who is it that runs the show? Policy owner. Policy owner. <laughs> what is the insurance company's function? Administrate the policy. Administrate of your system. The go first. You go, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I've had, I've had the privilege of calling a number of presidents of life insurance companies gophers. <laughs> <laughs> and they understand. Yeah. Because that's the truth. Yeah. yeah, they're caring. They're caring out the, the uh, administrative part of this whole system. And they do a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't get better efficiency than what I see out of the insurance industry. All right, now, uh, let's see here. Come on. Uh, okay, uh, so that was 2009, right? Now, you notice that I only have one, two, three, four, five. Nice. I have about uh, $2,400 in that policy, that's all. My cost basis at this point, $2,400. Uh, 